As a premier community in Hampton Roads, James City County strives to maintain a high quality of life for all citizens through sound fiscal management and legislative actions. In an ongoing effort to increase transparency, your Board of Supervisors holds public meetings to garner citizen input before making important decisions. Here's tonight's meeting agenda. Stay tuned, the Board of Supervisors meeting will begin shortly. This meeting, James City County Board of Supervisors, a regular meeting to order on May 11, 2021. Mr. Stevens, you call roll call. Yes, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Eisenhower represents the Jamestown District. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Larson represents the Berkeley District. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Mr. McGlennon represents the Roberts District. Mr. Hipple? Here. Mr. Hipple represents the Powhatan District and is chair of the board. Sitting to my far right is Adam Kinsman, County Attorney, and I'm Scott Stevens, County Administrator. It's my pleasure to be clerk to the board. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm requesting to add a commendation presentation to the agenda after the pledge and have received a request from the county administrator to add a closed session to the agenda for a property discussion. May I have a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. moved. So moved. Ms. Stevens, you call roll, please, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right, next we'll have our moment of silence and then our pledge of allegiance. And let's see, I don't know if we have a pledge leader tonight. Or not. What Mr. Is Kelly's someone? here from the school Mr. board Kelly. chair. School board chair, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance after a moment of silence? I know he knows it. His wife's a teacher. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chair, Mrs. Larson. Chair Kelly, we have a pen for you. <laughs> you won't walk Just away empty-handed. <laughs> there you go. Now you got two. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, next we'll do the presentation. So um, let's see. Coach Lynn and... Um, Principal Daniel Mioni, am I right? Am I correct? Jim?
Be good. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations, Coach. Hey. How are you? <laughs> Y'all, can you all get in? Sure. Stand back. We'll just stand back here. Oh, yes. We'll, yeah. we'll just peek through. Can you see over? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. All right, next we'll move into public comment. And our first speaker tonight, Peg Borman. Keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Hipple. Members of the board, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Kinsman, Mr. Reinheimer, Mr. Carmen Fax, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Peg Borman, and I reside at 17 Settlers Lane in Lightfoot, Virginia. And as per usual, I'm here to talk trash, and lots of it. As you know, on April 17th, we were blessed with the most beautiful weather, and that was our annual spring cleanup. And thank you, John, for coming out and giving us your moral support. Uh, but along with that, I want to say there were over 200 volunteers were out on the roadway. They were picking up the trash, and some are still doing it on a weekly basis now. We had 120 tires that were retrieved and destroyed the home of those thousands of mosquitoes. And we had over 400 hours of efforts with over 50 miles of roadways cleaned up, over two tons of trash and litter, and in that, 180 bags were brought to the convenience center. A great big thank you I, I want to send out to each and every one who volunteered to help uh, keep James City County keep James City County clean. Uh, some places were immediately trashed right away, but we can all feel good about the fact that for a few hours we had a very clean county. So many people from the county were out there willing to get their hands dirty and pick up that litter and trash. Ms. Sadler, Mr. Carnifax, Mr. Powell, Ms. Boone, Mr. Reinheimer, Ms. Batten, and even families with small children. I can't name everybody, so anyway. They were, the small children were out there cleaning up trails in the parks and on the highways. The Ripleys, the Austins, the Peligs, the Wood Friends, all their families. The James City Ruitan Club was out there, the Oak Tree Hunt Club, the War Hill Environmental Club, which is a new club at War Hill, uh, Seasons Trace, Wexford Hills, Stonehouse Association. There were 34 groups, too many to really name them all, and all the James City County commissioners played a large part in this endeavor. And I'm so proud of all of our citizens in James City County. I applaud each and every one of you and if I fail to mention your name or your group or your, your neighborhood or whatever, please know that I didn't intentionally 
try to name everybody because it's just too many. But thank you all so very, very much. But beautification is also an importance to our, our county. This past Saturday, we had approximately 50 people show up at Veterans Park to plant um, the plants in the pollinator garden. And that came about with Emma Newman, my co-chair, last uh, fall or last summer. She did a program on stewardship power about um, pollen, plants and pollinations and so forth. And that came to fruition as we hoped it would be. And so thanks to all the people who worked at least a couple of three hours planning all those. And at the same time, I want to throw out a kudos for the James City Ruitan Club. They planted a red, white, and blue flower box in front of the Will Barnes shelter. And Will was a co-chairman with me on the Clean County Commission for several years, as well as an ardent uh, member of the Ruitan Club. Thanks to Peggy Kraft for her expertise and to the uh, JC grounds crew and all the others that did all the work that it made it come, become possible. And it does look beautiful out there. So if you have a chance to go out and to look at it, it would be worth your time, I think. So thank you for your time and thank you for me allowing me to come and talk trash again tonight. Thank you. And Peg, thank you for all your hard work putting everything together and organizing that. That's a lot of work behind the scenes people don't see. Thank you. All right, our next speaker, Rosemary Vatican. Vatican. Thank you, ma'am. Come forward. <clears throat> Welcome. How can you see in your apartments? <clears throat> it's hard to hear me, I know. The reason we're here is basically Cox. We like to enjoy programs, education, and such, but we are literally breaking our back just to pay these bills. I have to say that we don't have service, and right now I can tell you we don't have internet. We haven't had telephone problems. This is a company we depend on <clears throat> and pay for, and yet they're not doing what they should be doing. And we need some investigation to be done. Number one, if you send me an independent contractor who says, where does this plug go? How does it make you feel? Because I know when I have a problem, I have to call a technician in. And believe me, 118 is my apartment number. Look it up constantly. You are the people who make these decisions, OK? Realize we want to have the enjoyment, the education we need, but we can't give our blood to do it. And you need to step in and get these guys to give us a senior rate, a reasonable rate. We have the right to that. And that's the reason I'm here. I apologize that we don't have more people here, but you know how it is. But we will have a petition out of my apartment complex, which again is Parkview Senior Apartments. Now, this is something I've never done before, but I have to say, you have to help. You are the people who have the, the authority and the demand to do it. That's why we're here. We have another speaker, Edith, will also tell you some more important things than I can, but I hope that I've clarified enough that this is the time you need to wake up and look at this. There are other companies available, OK? And unfortunately, if they cannot follow rules, actually give us what we're paying for, do you realize we're paying $200 to $350 for telephone? $35 for a telephone, and they say, well, we're going to get rid of the home phone. And Ms. Vaticano, you're going to love us. We're going to give you $5 off the $40 bill. Isn't that terrific? I have to call for equipment because my equipment burns out. And why? Because they're sending recycle equipment. It doesn't hold up. I put this in your lap, and I'm hoping that you listen seriously and get something done, because seniors are fed up. That's the whole discussion. OK? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank appreciate you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Edith Harold. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Edith Hurd. I was born here in 1941. And I have watched Williamsburg change. 
and the change I don't particularly care for. I'm here about Cox Cable, and I think you, 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 and you are responsible because you allowed these people to come in here and take over. The thing that really destroyed me this morning was the fact that when I read their contract that you approved that ends June the 31st, that they have the right to charge people six times more and for the boxes for the television if they have a poor credit rating. Now, is that geared at everybody? No, it's geared at people of color. And I hate to say that, but you know it's the truth. And I expected you guys that I have worked hard for to be reelected, to have looked out for the community better than that. And the trick to the trade today was, I read their contract at 7 this morning. 11 o'clock, they had wiped out Section 7A. What does that say? I'm dealing with a bunch of crooks, and so are you. Are you being paid by them to do us this way? We need answers. We do have a group. And I had a lot of questions I wanted to ask. I have a lot of things that I thought we could put in. But when I found out that you all gave them the right to triple charge people, I was crushed. And that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. And, and we are working very hard um, trying to get other providers, as we always have, in the community. And we've got the community opened up. We've got staff members working on this. I, for one, didn't have Cox, period. And if you go back years, several years back, you can hear me railing on Cox and what they're not doing and what they're not giving to the community. And if you're not in a cluster, doesn't matter whether you get it or not. So this board, I can say we are definitely not being paid by Cox. We are definitely open for business for anyone. We're looking right now hard at 5G across James City County. And that way anybody can get on the line. So there's a lot of possibilities we're working on right now that we're working very hard to try. Because wasn't too long ago, I'm still frustrated with them, but was majorly frustrated. And, and the board members can tell you, I'd rail for a, quite a while up here on Cox and what they were not doing for our community. So we understand your, your needs and all that, and we'll address them. And if you want to send us any emails and that sort of thing, please feel free to email wherever whatever area you're in, email your representative, and that way we can have a conversation about that and get back to you as well. At the very least, Mr. Stevens, would you be able to get the address, though, of the, um, I mean, because I imagine Mr. Stork could help us sure, get started. I, we should have that on the speaker cards, and we'll okay. be happy to try to follow up. And I wouldn't be able to Hold on, the school is a shared school system. The school is a, sh I mean, Ginsburg, James City County is also a shared government system. So how did you manage to segregate us like that? Well, and we won't get into it today, but it is two separate governments, and one's a city and one's a county, and different governments work in different ways. But um, if you email us, whoever your representative is, we'll get back to you and make sure you get answers on that. And the county administrator's got your speaker cards, or I've got them here. So we've got your addresses and all that, and we'll reach out to you as well and um, see what we can do to help. Well, we are organizing the community. Great. Glad to see it. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. And, and I will uh, uh, add that uh, 
Ms. Hurd is one of my constituents, and I have her on speed dial, so we don't need to email. We can talk. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and and I, I, yes, Ms. Ms. Chairman, I just add one other thing, which is that in, in communicating to us, uh, uh, I very much appreciate the, the concerns, and, and it's the frustration that we all feel. We have reached out several times to the alternate providers in the area who have told us they are not interested in coming here, and we keep asking them to come in, uh, but they, they say they won't do it. Uh, and as far as the, the nature of our relationship with Cox, um, it would be a good idea to include our federal representatives because it's federal legislation that prevents us from controlling anything about uh, the ch choice of channels, uh, the, pr the pricing structure, and so forth. We have very limited areas in which we can even have an impact. Yep, thank you. All right, next on um, our consent calendar, we have nothing on our consent calendar and we'll move into public hearings. So our first public hearing is, is number one, ordinance to levy the cigarette tax. Mr. Bradshaw, how you doing, sir? I saw you come in. Did you step out? Richard, there he is. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, you have before you this evening an ordinance which will enact a cigarette tax in James City County, uh, effective September 1st, 2021. As you know, during the uh, 2021 session, General Assembly granted the authority to enact, to levy, levy such a tax uh, for all counties within the Commonwealth. Uh, September 1 has been chosen as the date for to be effective so that we can properly uh, obtain the necessary information and supplies to assess the tax in a, in a uh, correct manner. Based on a September 1st effective date, uh, best, rec best estimate we have is that revenues would be approximately $850,000 for the fiscal year. Uh, direct expenses such as the purchase of stamps and shipping costs probably come out to about twenty thousand uh, dollars, netting eight hundred and thirty thousand uh, for other county uh, county uses. Administration of the tax will be within the Commissioner of the Revenue's office. If anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer. Any questions? I, I would comment. I, I, I did spoke to speak to Mr. Bradshaw earlier because I wanted to make sure. Um, <clears throat> apparently, the way this um, I didn't didn't realize the way this works is uh, the cigarette retailers or wholesalers um, uh, get their stamps from him and they pay for it at that time. So the revenue does come directly into the uh, Commissioner of the Revenue's office, um, and then um, they handle that from there on, putting the stamps on the cigarettes, which is distributed out. So it's a it's a, a fairly straightforward process from our standpoint, which I did not understand that fully until he uh, uh, mentioned it to me. Appreciate that. Any other comments? All right, I'm going to read this um, letter from Sue. Sue can't be here tonight. And um, as a statement of my last meeting, my daughter is graduating from dental hygienist program at Thomas Nelson this evening, which is why I'm not present tonight. This, who, is, this is a huge accomplishment for her and a true comeback testimony that makes our family very proud. I do have a few comments on my position on a few items on our agenda as they pertain to our budget. I'm opposed to the cigarette tax. It is a regressive tax that could be detrimental to small business, especially in my end of James City County. It is also my opinion and an extremely poor time to implement a tax increase as we continue to navigate through the pandemic. Therefore, because of this tax is included in our budget, I do not support this year's budget. As always, I appreciate the hard work f that Sharon and the staff have put together through this process. I also have an issue with the request by the schools regarding trailers. The request comes without adequate justification for the trailers, and I'm not convinced that the number of requests are necessary. In my term, of the S in my terms of the SUP, I will, I'm willing to consider some of the trailers, but for a shorter period of time, 
one or two years at the most, with the condition that the detailed permanent plans to expand PK, PK uh, facilities is provided. With that, I'd like to again thank my colleagues and their support and understanding of my family's commitment to this evening. So that was, this is a big evening for her and her daughter and family, so that's the reason she couldn't be here tonight and all the board members knew, but I want to make sure the general public knew and, and I read that statement out for her as well. So what I'll do now is I'll go ahead and open up the um, public hearing and let me make sure I don't have any, no other speaker cards have come in for the public hearing. Okay, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and um, I'll look for the board for discussion I'll move the motion. Okay. I'll, before we get into that, moving the motion, I'll, I'd like to bring one thing up. The, um, you know, we've all tried to get this through, and, and I've worked with y'all as well on getting this tax through, but with the, the pandemic and the money that we're receiving and next year's money that we'll probably receive on um, – the um, personal property taxes and 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 that's why I, I don't think at this time I'm going to support this motion as far as a tax increase at this time. But I do support that you know it's something would we have worked hard to get and make us even with cities and understanding that. But just the way it hit right now, I wouldn't be able to support it. Just want to let y'all know. Thank you. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Roll call, please, sir. Sir, Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Miss Larson. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Motion carries. Good. Thank you all. All right, number two, Board of Supervisors and Board of Directors annual salary. Ms. Palmer, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Good Chairman, evening. members of the board. Um, at your retreats in January of 2021, the Board of Supervisors and the JCSA Board of Directors considered their respective salaries. Um, salaries for those boards have not changed in at least 20 years. Um, the attached ordinance and resolutions sets the Board of Supervisors annual salary at $11,000 beginning January 1 of next year and sets the JCSA Board of Directors salary at $3,000 beginning July 1 of this year. Um, salaries increase by 2.5% every two years thereafter. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? All right. Looks good. All right. I'll go ahead and open up a public comment. See no speaker card, so I'll go ahead and close the public comment. Look for the board for direction or motion. I'll move the motion and also an appreciation for the board considering looking at this matter. Um, I think it goes, you know, it, it's been several years and we do, people may not realize it, but this does take a lot of time and a lot of time away from our regular jobs. So, um, and I do, the, the piece about raising it, I think takes pressure off other boards um, to it, that it doesn't become a political hot potato. So with that, I move the motion. Roll call, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Number three, orders to amend county codes, chapter nine, article one of fire prevention code. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, members of the board. Uh, before you was an ordinance revising the county's current fire prevention ordinance. Uh, the fire marshal and the county attorney's office revised the article so that it would be more user-friendly for county residents and for staff. Uh, the board considered revisions during its March 9th meeting and instructed staff to consider additional revisions to better define household debris and land clearing debris and also to better describe restrictions on the burning of yard waste. Um, the ordinance before you better defines those terms and it further clarifies that yard waste shall only be burned in piles no larger than five by five by five and, on, and only on those lots zoned A1, except for those in platted subdivisions, excluding family subdivisions. Um, the fire marshal and I um, recommend adoption of the attached ordinance. I'm happy to answer any questions and I will recognize fire marshal Lamb is here tonight. Questions? I know we had, we had talked and, and a lot of this is coming down to us. So it's not changes that James City County's making, it's statewide changes that and the changes we made were the changes basically on what yard trash would be and what household trash would be. Because sometimes you get people that are burning in a burn barrel and they think because it came from in the house, it's household trash that they could burn and it's plastics and everything else. And so we wanted to more define what household trash was so that 
the next door neighbor wouldn't be smelling plastics burning while they're out in their yard and one neighbor is trying to, you know, burn the stuff. That, so it gives them a chance to still burn some of the products that we have, but the products that, that are harmful to us and the neighbors, we took those out. Yes, yes Mr. Hipple. And the goal here is to really make this ordinance clearer to people who, who are, you know, confused about, about what the rules are. I don't think they're out just burn whatever. They just don't know, and this will help them figure it out. Not a question, but just a comment and a thank you to the county administrator and the police uh, fire chief and then the fire crew that responded. I, I got a call on Sunday night that there was some uh, pre-treated lumber or something. It turned out to be flooring, uh, laminate flooring that was being burned in a neighborhood, and the smell was quite toxic to the neighbors. And, and uh, Sunday night, I didn't know quite what how, Anyway, and I really appreciate you all taking the time and, and getting that handled because that was quite harmful to the people that were around. So thank you. So hopefully something like this will help clear something from that happening again. Okay, I'll go ahead and open up the... Any uh, speaker cards for the public comment? None here. So I'll go ahead and close that and look to the board for a motion. Or any other motion. Discussion. All right. We have a motion on the floor. Roll call, please, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right, number four, an ordinance to amend the recordation of Chapter 23, Chesapeake Bay Preservation of the County Code of James City County to regulate the use of retaining walls by adding new Section 23-9.1, Performance Standards of Retaining Walls, and amending Section 23-10, uh, Plan of Development, an ordinance to amend the recordation chapter four building regulations of the code of james city county virginia by amending article two supplementary regulations by adding new section 14-17 performance standards for retaining walls mr holt thank that you was enough there to say it was a, it was a <laughs> lot for sure <laughs> um, thank you again mr chairman members of the board good evening as you'll recall on march the 9th the board of supervisors deferred this item pending additional review by the Retaining Wall Working Group. Following a series of meetings and discussions, the proposed ordinance has been updated. A few of the more substantive updates include updating the ordinance such that it does not apply to seawalls or bulkheads. Suitable materials now include masonry, aluminum, vinyl, stone, and or steel. Marine grade timber may be used on single family lots when the wall is less than six feet tall. Should an applicant wish to use a different material, a waiver process has been created. The allowable wall heights have been adjusted. The ordinance now permits for wall segments to be up to six feet tall within a nine foot horizontal separation to maintain about a 33 degree pitch or about a one in three slope up to a maximum of 24 feet. Should the applicant wish to construct a taller retaining wall, a height limitation waiver process has been added for that item to be considered by the Board of Supervisors. Added a requirement that guards are required for fall protection at the top of all of the walls or top of the wall. Added a requirement that the retaining wall system shall be such that its construction and removal of the entire wall is possible without impacting the foundations or proposed foundations of habitable structures. Added a requirement that the design of the retaining wall system shall require a maintenance plan, copy of which shall be on file with the county, and which maintenance plan shall be implemented by a licensed professional at intervals recommended by the design engineer. Other changes were incorporated as well, which have all been noted in the staff report. Staff recommends approval of the two ordinances contained in your agenda packets. And I'm joined this evening by Ms. Tony Small, our Director of Stormwater Resource Protection, and Mr. Tom Coghill, our Director of Building Safety and Permits. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions? I, I just wanted to uh, extend my thanks and appreciation to staff, as well as all the uh, members of the community who participated in that working group. Uh, I think. Uh, it was very productive. We got a lot of really good feedback, and I think as a result, we're going to have a, a better better ordinance than we would have had otherwise without the process. So um, my, my appreciation to everyone involved. Any other comments? No. All right, I'll go ahead and open it up for any public comments. And I don't have any speaker cards on this one either, so I'll go ahead and close that and look for the board for a motion, direction, or discussion. Could I make the motion to approve? And in so doing, I would like to uh, um, mention for the public that uh, this all came to light for me when I was called over into Newtown to look at a retaining wall that I did not know existed. 
Uh, and when I got there, it was maybe about from me to Mr. Stevens from the edge of a building to a drop off that was about 50 feet into a BMP, uh, which was beginning to fail. It had problems uh, as because it was built by a developer who had gone bankrupt. And uh, we're still in the bankruptcy proceedings with the uh, um, bond being called to get things fixed. And the concern from the citizens in the community was here was a piece of uh, infrastructure that was going to become part of their homeowners association or neighborhood association that uh, they were concerned about it being in, in the proper uh, uh, shape, but they were also concerned about several safety issues. Um, and I was absolutely astounded that we had walls like that. And staff informed me that that wasn't the only one. There were about four or five others around the county that created similar type, types of problems for them. So that was the genesis of this uh, uh, request to do the uh, ordinance. Um, the initial ordinance, as I had envisioned, it was just to have it come to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, staff uh, appropriately uh, took it and took as much as they could and put it under the uh, uh, administrative procedure, which uh, I, I thank them for that, that effort. Uh, and now we, the only thing that would be coming to the Board of Supervisors would be um, uh, requests for variances on it. So um, I, it was really well, work well, well done, and I'll, I'll move the, the, uh, the motion. I want to say as well, I want to thank the, you know, the, the board. And um, you know, when, when Jim brought this forward, we, we thought we had a pretty good plan. And then the, the citizens and especially our professional groups out there came to us and said, there's some flaws and there's some issues you may want to look at on this. Can we hold off on this until we look at it? So the board said, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. And, and the board appointed Jim and I to uh, meet with that group. And we met with the group and, and they came out with some, and, and you can tell because I don't have any speaker cards tonight. And they came out with some very good ideas on how to, make this work all the way around, meet our needs, meet the citizens' needs, and meet their needs as they're building these walls and, and put things together. So I want to thank that group as well. And I, I think the meeting went very, very well, don't you think? Sure. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we have a motion on the floor. Let's see. Did I close the public hearing? All right. We have a motion on the floor. And um, call the roll, please, sir. Yes, sir. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next is Z-21-011.115 Nord Center Proffers Amendment. Mr. Meadows. Hey, welcome, sir. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman yes, and sir. members of the board. How's, how's my volume here? Good. good. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Vernon Getty of Getty, Harris, Frank, and Hickman on behalf of Chesapeake Bank has applied to amend existing adopted proffers for a parcel of land zoned B1. General business with proffers to include additional commercial uses allowed within the B1 district. The property is located at 115 Norge Lane. Existing proffers on the parcel limit the uses to a shopping center and office uses. Chesapeake Bank is in the process of renovating an existing building for office space and is in negotiation with the daycare center to occupy approximately 15,000 square feet within the same building. The proposed daycare use does not fit within the definition of a shopping center and the proposed proffer amendment requests expanding the list of commercial uses permitted on the property in hopes to gain flexibility in renting additional vacant space within the existing building. In addition to the daycare, the full list of proposed commercial uses is listed in Exhibit B of the proposed proffers. This list of uses includes many by right commercial uses of the B1 district. No new development or construction is proposed other than renovation of the existing building. The proposed use, uses are compatible with the B1 zoning district and with the currently adopted comprehensive plan. At their April 7th, 2021 meeting, the Planning Commission voted seven to one to recommend approval of this proffer amendment. With these considerations in mind, staff recommends the Board of Supervisors approve this proffer amendment as well. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions and I believe the applicant is here as well. Thank you. Question for Brett. No? No? All right, I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing and our first speaker is Mr. Getty. Mr. 
Chairman, members of the board, I'm Vernon Getty with 1177 Jamestown Road. Pleasure to be here on behalf of Chesapeake Bank tonight. Uh, we obviously agree with the staff and Planning Commission recommendations. Uh, I'm excited to say the identity of the daycare center is the Kensington School, which is a um, great operator based in the county, has been in business for about 10 years now and has two locations in the county. So. Uh, the bank is very excited to have them in the building, and I think it'll be a great addition to the Norge area to have that service. Um, as much as I love coming before you guys, I think the rest of the proffer amendment is designed to prevent me from having to do that every time a new um, use comes along. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions and ask you to approve the, the amendment. I was reading on the report that the traffic flow is going to be about basically half of what it it's used to be. It's about half the, of what the yeah, grocery store which is used good. to be. Exactly. Any questions? No. Mr. Chair, is your PC rep online? I think she was going to be. She was supposed to be. That's what I was going to ask next. Perfect. Thank you. Is she? Thank you. Can we hear? Julie? Yes. Are you I'm there? Here. Yes. Can you? I, think I can, can hear We can her. barely hear. Can you hear? Can you hear me? I can yes. hear you now. There you go. Okay. All right. Good. You're good up. Mr. Nipple, <laughs> Thank you. The planning commission supported this request. Our only comment was positive regarding additional daycare services in the county, and we unanimously recommended approval. So, if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. Questions. Thank you. Keep up the great work. We appreciate you taking time for us tonight. Thanks for allowing me to participate remotely. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you feel better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Now we'll go ahead and we've got the public in it and we have no more speaker cards. So I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and look for the board for direction or decision or discussion. Move the motion. Move the motion. Roll call, please, sir. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Motion carries. All right, next is our Learning Cottage public hearing. John? Are going to do each one individually or we can, all I together? I, I was thinking we would do them all as a group, but then if we want to vote on them, we could vote on them individually or vote on them as a group, and I'll let the board make a decision okay. on that of how you all feel after we get through the, you know, going through all of them. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Mr. Stephen Talley has applied on behalf of the WJCC school system for six special use permits to allow for the installation of eight temporary learning cottages at elementary schools in the county. Each learning cottage consists of two classrooms and can accommodate up to 50 total students. The applicant has indicated that the learning cottages are intended to provide additional classroom space, allowing for the reduction of class sizes and for COVID-19 social distancing. The applicant has requested to have the cottages in place from the 2021 2022 to the 2024 2025 school years. SEP 21 5 is for the installation of one learning cottage at Clara Bird Baker Elementary School. SEP 21 6 is for the installation of one learning cottage at JB Blayton Elementary School. SEP 21 7 is for the installation of one learning cottage at DJ Montague Elementary School. SEP 21 8 is for the installation of one learning cottage at Laurel Lane Elementary School. SCP 21-10 is for the installation of two learning cottages at Norge Elementary School. And SCP 21-11 is for the installation of two learning cottages at Stonehouse Elementary School. These properties are zoned public lands and designated federal, state, and county land within the adopted comprehensive plan. Staff finds these proposals to be compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. Staff recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve these applications subject to the proposed conditions. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, and representatives from WJCC schools are here as well. Thank you. Questions? I think there may be some questions when, uh, staff, when the uh, schools are... Uh, right. I, I, I no say public hearing then. Yeah. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. And we have no speaker cards for award. So anybody you want to invite up from the school in order to have Superintendent Dr. Herring and um, Chair Kelly, if y'all have any questions. 
Anybody have any questions? That yeah, I, I had provided uh, uh, by email, I think, uh, a list of questions that I was trying to get some answers to, um, and I think uh, yes, I had a couple of additional ones okay. that I think we provided to the. Yeah, and so I, I think it would pro probably be best to have them come up and and, and uh, tell us a little bit about you know what they've got on the things we had tried to provide it in advance, and we can go from there with questions, I guess. Welcome. Karen. Good evening, Chairman Hipple, members of the board, and, and Mr. Stevens. Um, thank you for the questions in advance. Mr. Eisenhower will attempt to answer uh, those questions this evening. Uh, thank you, first of all, for considering the special use permits for learning cottages for, at six of our elementary schools. There are three reasons that are driving the need to add instructional space at elementary schools next year. First, there's the need for social distancing at three feet to the greatest extent possible. Uh, second, there's a need for smaller class size due to, to, due to learning loss and addressing social and emotional needs also. And also, we want to ensure we have all students in schools five days a week starting next year. Currently, we have over 3,500 elementary students who are learning in person at the moment, and they are approximately three, to three feet apart, the social distancing. We have over 1,000 elementary st students in our virtual academy who will need to also return to the classrooms next year. And we need the space to ensure all students are there five days with the appropriate physical distance. To address some of the question, the annual cost for trailer lease is 23,296 per trailer. The total cost of eight cottages for four years is $745,459. The setup costs and lease of the additional space is an expenditure that may be covered by CARES Act funding or ESSER fundings, that's elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds, as the addition of space for social distance, distancing, sorry, I can't speak with the mask very well. The additional space for social distancing is an allowable expense under ESSER funds. Currently, we have two trailers uh, or cottages in the operating budget and the remainder will be CARES Act or ESSER funded. As ESSER funds need to be used by September 2024, the lease cost after that date would be at the local level because those funds have to be expended by that time. So there'll be one year and nine months still remaining of the four years. Our normal target size, class size, is 20 to one in K through two. 23 to 1 in third grade and 25 to 1 in grades 4 and 5. However, our reality for the last several years is that class size caps in kindergarten through 2 have been 23 to 1. In third grade, they have really been 25 to 1. And in fourth grade, we have many, fourth and fifth grade, we have many classes at 28 to 1, with some classes even going up to 30 students in a class. Without the trailers, we will have several classes in several schools at, a, at or above 28 to 1. So we've literally taken every school by grade level by class. So we may have over the amount in fifth grade, but we may be, be under in first or second grade in a particular school because students don't come in little bundles already to, 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 deal, to, to me measure against capacity. Um, with, with the approved trailers, our goal is to keep K2, kindergarten through second grade at 20 to one, and all other grades at 23 to one or below to allow for social distancing. Normally, each trailer holds 25 students, each classroom in each trailer, that's 50 per two trailers. With social distancing, our goal is to cap trailer classes at 20 to 22, as they are slightly smaller than our normal classroom space. So they would hold probably 40 to 44 students. Uh, Pre-K numbers have no impact on the need for trailers at all. Pre-K operates, as you know, at five schools with a total of 31 classrooms and they are all in use this year and they will be fully in use next year again. The trailers will not increase our capacity to add pre-K space. All of the space needs are in regular elementary school classrooms. Students are already socially distanced in pre-K because those classes are capped at 15 for some classes and eight students in other classes, which are special education classes. Um, that's some of the questions addressed, but Mr. Kiever, Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Walker, Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Schools, 
Mr. Snipe, Senior Director for Operations, and Mr. Falzone over Capital Projects are here with me this evening. And of course, uh, Mr. Kelly has joined us this evening as well. And we'll be happy to address any other questions you may have right now. But thank you again for your consideration. Go ahead. Questions? Uh, so, how, thank you for being here, by the way. Um, and thank you for bringing the pledge leader. Um, <laughs> how long do you think that, the, are you hearing anything about how long you expect the social distancing piece to be in effect? I think, Mrs. Larson, that's the $20 million question. Uh, obviously, it was just announced today that vaccinations will be available from 12 years and up. There are already studies for younger children, but we don't expect those to be ready or available by the beginning of school. So it's, it's really difficult to know. Plus, vaccinations are not um, expected right now. They're not required. And so parents have a choice and, and students have a choice whether to be vaccinated or not. Um, with vaccinations, social distancing does not have to be done to the same extent. One of the biggest uh, advantages of being vaccinated is that we don't quarantine children and we don't quarantine staff. If you didn't have the social distancing issue next year, would it still be your recommendation to reduce your class size because of the loss? What, what are you seeing as far as loss of learning have you gotten into the SOLs yet or you probably don't have the data back but we don't have the data back but our preliminary assessments would suggest there's considerable loss of learning in math and some in reading as well uh, we are looking at a three-year plan uh, with summer school and lower class size and a a plan to address um, learning loss over three years uh, that's that's currently our thinking I think that's all my questions for right now. And I had a couple of uh, the, um, things you had talked about that I just wanted to get a clarification. Um, you mentioned that there were uh, pre-K in five schools for 31 classes. I had four at 30, so obviously I'm I'm, I'm behind on, on the times. Uh, uh, is that because there's is there one at James River or what? Uh, there were actually two classes, pre-K classes, out of a DJ. I think okay. two years ago, Mr. Walker. Okay as it was extended at that time. Okay, all right. Um, the other question I had was that our, in looking through all of this, our um, materials that we got with each of these um, simply indicated that the adjustment to class size was going to be based upon uh, the number of students with free and reduced lunch, which raised a lot of questions in my mind. But it sounds like what you're telling me is that that was it was, that's not necessarily accurate. They, they, you're, it's more looked at, a, at a, in a more general across the board from a social distancing and class size uh, uh, perspective. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the original, when we started to look at uh, the use of trailers in the school division next year, the original request was for two schools, uh, James River and Norge Elementary, and that was based on a different class size based on free and reduced lunch. Right. So that was the original thinking. Um, a couple of months ago, we started to realize that we would need to socially distance at the beginning of next year, and we have a thousand more students to accommodate at elementary. Okay. Right, that, that, that helps because that, uh, it was very, you know, uh, when I read through it, it, it oh. none of what you had told us about social distancing was in the package that we got. And when it mentioned free and reduced lunch, it left so many open questions that I, I, I couldn't understand how the, 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 maybe the, uh, decisions were, were arrived at. So um, I, I think maybe uh, that, was, that was one concern. Uh, the other was um, you mentioned that, that pre-K, is pre-K uh, active right now or is it fully, fully uh, operational? Or Because I, I was under the impression that with uh, uh, the virtual setup we had that you probably weren't doing a lot of the pre-K pre programs uh, this year. Actually, pre-K has been the first to come back at every level and they are fully operational right okay. now. Um, when did they, how long have they been back? Um, Mr. Walker, do you have a sense of? September 14th. Okay, so actually pretty much then for the whole school year. Yes, I think they were out for a number of weeks uh, in the highest of, of the, the pandemic and then they were back in okay, again. And then it, as, as, you, as you went through the school year, it was the, the higher grades were the ones that were added later. You started the lower grades where you're bringing them back and 
That's correct. A lot of the research suggested that the, the spread of COVID-19 was less in That's the lower correct. grades, whereas adults were more vulnerable and our older students are young adults. Okay. And, and then essentially, the, the, if I remember correctly, you said that the total was about a little over 700 and something thousand for a, a, a year um, for uh, the, the trailers. 745,459 for four years. How much? For four, four years. years. For, for all four, years. four years. For eight cottages. 745,000. 40, 745, that's good enough. For four years. Okay, that, that, that helps. And that about a uh, little over half of it would be paid, could be paid by um, the Recovery or Cares Act. And that after, after that, uh, it would be. Absolutely, and all of the setup costs and the equipment would all be paid for prior to the end of the grant as well. So the only remaining expense to, for the last period of time would be local funding, and that's about a year and nine months. Okay. Um, that's all my questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Superintendent uh, Heron, for, for coming tonight. I really do appreciate it, especially because I think some of the comments you've made have clarified some of the issues out there. Um, I was a little perplexed about the, the notion that, uh, as the report on these uh, SUPs indicated, the, the effort was uh, really directed toward free and reduced lunch um, and reducing class size. And I was trying to figure out how you do that at schools that um, don't have very high levels of, of free and reduced lunch, how do you determine um, that some classrooms will have uh, um, lower enrollments or will you treat them the same way you would at a school where the total numbers were very high? So it was very uh, hard to figure out exactly how that was going to be implemented. What I'm hearing is that you intend to reduce class sizes across the board uh, because uh, of an expectation that uh, bringing students back uh, to a um, uh, higher level of, of achievement is going to be challenging uh, in the next year or so. Is That's that correct, Mr. Mulan, and it's not. We're not looking at free and reduced lunch at this moment in time. We're right. more concerned about bringing all classroom sizes down right. for loss right. of learning and for the pandemic. And so there are really two issues involved, and one is the social distancing issue, and the other is the, the um, effort to bring down uh, the class sizes. Do you, do you have an estimate of how many of the trailers um, are essentially driven by the social distancing issue relative to the um, uh, class size issue? I would, yeah. Yes, I think Mr. Walker has literally done this analysis, I mean, classroom by classroom and grade by grade in every single school. Uh, so he can probably provide mm -hmm. some more sp specific numbers on that. Mr. Walker, want to join me? Good evening. Good so two of the trailers were previously mentioned, Norge, James River, taken care of, and then we have right. the additional six, um, but we're looking at class size, so that's with staffing needs to reduce class size uh, ratio. We have the need there with the staffing piece with social distancing. So there's really no impact in terms of the social distancing? Is, is the is, is issue going to be essentially that by reducing class size to address the need for um, a closer student-teacher interaction, uh, you are um, ac accomplishing the social distancing? Yes, we're basically, we will have every classroom with, we hope, less than 23 to one, 23 students to a teacher in a classroom across the board. Ideally, it's 20, but it could go up to 23. And that's looking at, at, at enrollment coming in in the fall. And, and so that would, uh, that would be something that can be accomplished within the classroom spaces that you're um, requesting? That yes, with the additional yeah. trailers. Yeah. I had had one other question earlier, and that was uh, before these, these eight that you're talking about right now, um, how many trailers do we have are already currently existing and at, at, and at what schools? Do you know? Do you happen to know that offhand? I think Mr. Kiever has that information at, on his fingertips this, this evening. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir, good evening. Uh, there is currently a trailer at Matthew Whaley Elementary School 
Uh, that trailer was leased in 2014, and the SUP for that expires in 2022. Uh, there's a second trailer at Matthew Whaley that was leased in 2019, with that SUP expiring again in July of 2022. Stonehouse Elementary currently has one that was leased in 2020. It was put in the summer, I believe. The SUP expires in July of 2024. We also put one at Jamestown High School over the course of the summer, and that again expires in July of 2024. We've also talked about eight, but I believe in a previous meeting, uh, you reviewed one at James, R James River Elementary as well. I, now my, my understanding was that, that we approved that one earlier, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So that one, that one, so James River, that one is separate from this. That's already already gone. Correct. So but I just wanted to be sure when I was telling you yeah. where we already had trailers. That okay, you would, yeah, okay. Okay. So there's one at James River, and that was the one we just did recently. There will be one. That will, will be. Yes, sir. We've, we've given the approval. It's you, you, you're going to okay. Um, okay. Well, that helps. Um, and I had just two follow-ups. Um, so, as you know, the county administrator's budget does not reflect an elementary school um, at this time. I, are you planning to keep that elementary school on when you take it back to your, your when your board gets this budget back, um, assuming that you're going to keep the elementary school in your CIP? I believe if it's not funded and not part of the CIP that comes back to us, that we approve the CIP that's sent back to us, Mr. Okay. Kelly. So you, then you would have to re-put it back on if you chose. That's, that's correct. So then September 30 enrollment, I, I guess we will continue the conversation to see where you, you are at that point. And then, so there's always class size that you shoot for and you just never can get there. Um, do you feel fairly confident that you're going to be able to, it, with these trailers, you're going to be able to keep the class size where you are, knowing that anything could happen. You could have additional kids show up that you weren't expecting. And you, at that point, you're going to be setting a precedent in some ways. So what type of conversations are you having with your teachers to say for the, I mean are you for the next three years we're going to try to do this to get us back because of loss of learning I guess you can't look that far out in the future to say we'd like to keep these class sizes and ideally you want them to be better than they are now we haven't actually hit our target right. class size in years uh, when you add trailers you add teachers Right. So we will be adding additional teachers to teach in every trailer to address learning loss. Um, we don't know what enrollment is going to bring in the fall. We've already had 71 new, new students enrolled so far. We opened up in April. We've 82 students already re-enrolled from last year. Uh, just in the last, we opened kindergarten registration last week. We've 287 kindergarten registrations already. So I'm quite hopeful of our, our numbers going up considerably in the fall. So did you have some kindergartners that would have typically started kindergarten last year, but were held, that their parents possibly chose to hold, rather than try to do virtual, they're, they're gonna be starting kindergarten a year out? I am sure we have, and we will be obviously communicating with parents, and we've had virtual kindergarten registration sessions in the last week. Okay, thank you. And if I could just, <clears throat> just ask maybe about the, the finance, financial arrangements here, um, is, there, is there any financial upside or downside to a shorter um, period for the SUP? Um, it's difficult to say. I know we're all waiting patiently on the assessment of pre-K and how we can best, best serve our students in the community. Uh, with a lesser period of time, uh, it would be more difficult to plan for the future, whether it's pre-K or a new elementary school. Uh, there's nothing in the CIP this year because the elementary school was taken out. That means it goes into design the following year. It takes two years to build. So no matter how we do this, 
four years would allow us the space to survive until we actually have additional space, whether it's in a pre-K or an elementary school. And is there a difference in terms of the um, agreements on the uh, rental of the trailers? Uh, they think the rental is, is stable for the next four years. Confirmed. Thank you very much. Um, two other questions. Um, the, you, you mentioned uh, having everybody back next year, um, including the ones that are virtual now. Are there going to be, uh, are you planning on no option for, for students in elementary school to continue in a virtual mode next year, or is that, how, how's that going to work? Are, you gonna, are they going to be all, all back in person regardless? We've actually made a virtual option, but it's not in our buildings and it's not by our staff at elementary. Uh, we're actually using Virtual Virginia. Uh, the Virginia Department of Education has, has worked with Virtual Virginia to create a K through five option. And we have put that out to parents for those who really want a virtual option because they don't want to come back to school. And I believe we have about 70, 75 students enrolled. Uh, they have until July to change their minds, uh, but that's what we've got right now. Okay, that, that answers my question then, thank you. Um, the other thing too was uh, the historical number I had gotten uh, that we were serving in pre-K was 395, and we had a waiting list of like 160 or something. Is that still? That, that's still accurate. Still yeah, accurate. 395 so. places and we always have more students wanting to be okay. served. So uh, but we're looking at 150 or more on, uh, that, that would like it but can't get in because of space. That's, that's right, sir. Okay. But they would be qualified to... to yes, sir, they, they qualify. Right. right. One more question. How are you you're back to four days a week at your elementary schools? That's correct. Uh, everywhere. Oh, middle and high, too? That's right. Okay. And so it's... I've not heard an, any crazy thing happen. I mean, is it... it you seem to be fairly safe and healthy and... We have cases every day. Mr. Kiefer may want to, to speak to that just in terms of numbers of cases and quarantine of students, Mr. Kiefer. We, we do see positive cases in our students probably on a daily basis, which um, thankfully there has not been transmission that we've been able to determine within the building. Uh, this week, I believe we're quarantining about 82 of our students based on close contact designation. That number uh, fluctuates uh, from a week-to-week -week basis. We do include that information on our dashboard every week. We update it on Monday so the community can know what's going on with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I did want to um, offer, that I believe that you were given a copy of the little sheet that I had put together to discuss with my fellow board members, uh, talking about where we were with uh, utilization of capacity. Uh, and. Part of my frustration was I went and did this because I was trying to t figure out for myself in the absence of really clear information that we had in our uh, agenda package um, where we would be without the trailers and where we would be with them. And uh, I realized that there are some assumptions that may be incorrect in here, uh, but it, it was a, a, a pretty good first cut. And I just wanted to go over what I had done with it so you understood my rationale behind it. Um, the first one was if, if we assume we didn't do any, any, any trailers at all, and I put in the pre-K numbers that I had had at that point, plus I used the um, um, future think um, a low projection for uh, the elementary students and came up with a, an average of about 90% utilization across all nine schools, but that you had two of them, Layton and Laurel Lane, that were well over 100%. So, you know, it, it showed very clearly that uh, we have very, very crowded classrooms and we really, really do need some space. Um, when we did add the trailers in, uh, uh, that that brought it down to about 84 percent across the, the uh, elementary schools because of you adding about basically about capacity for almost 400 um, and that brought the numbers down but you still had Blayton and Laurel Lane up in the 90s uh, Laurel Lane still at 97 percent with the, the way you were uh, had it uh, worked out and then the surprising thing for me when you added one at Montague you you went from uh, uh, down to about 72 percent occupancy uh, uh, utilization. Now I know that there are other factors that you probably have considered uh, and things that you would that, you, that we are unaware of but I, in looking at that what it told me was I said yeah we need them uh, and it, it it buys us some breathing room till we can work out things longer term 
Um, but I was uh, of the opinion that we could probably uh, reallocate uh, you know, some of them. And the, and the bottom one there shows how I would propose reallocating it to, to try to bring it down. Uh, what that did was that basically brought the everybody down under 90%. Uh, and I didn't think it was necessary to put one at Montague based on my perception of it. Obviously, there are other factors, but uh, because it it has uh, uh, second only to James River for uh, you know the lowest utilization of, of, of capacity. Um, so anyway, that was that was to try to get, put forth a, a, a point that number one, I believe that you definitely do need the, the space, no question. Um, number two, there might be some question I would have about whether or not you uh, have could tweak tweak the uh, where you put them to get better uh, equity if you will amongst the schools but that's a decision you guys have to make um, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, you know you you had that information that, I, that at what I was thinking and, and looking at so so that maybe that little chart makes a little more sense to you and I'm perfectly willing to have a conversation with you about it uh, going forward because I'd be glad to hear you know where there were considerations that drive you one way that I might not be aware of as opposed to something that I might think that uh, I might not understand uh, about your circumstances. But we appreciate I did it. Make we sure appreciate you, you the were. analysis. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. it. And you probably won't have enough time because our next liaison meeting is in the morning, but maybe at our next one you could, and then we could bring that back. I think the word that wasn't used was redistricting rather than moving students around. It's not our favorite term, obviously. And I think that would be very difficult to do right in the middle of a pandemic oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with families already distressed and uh, moving them just because we need trailers. Well, I, 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 would, I would make the observation that at this, in this circumstance, it's probably not, not inappropriate to move the, 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 the buildings to where the students are as opposed to moving students, students to where the buildings are. Uh, although in the long term, in permanent facilities, I think we need to get back to moving the students to fill the, the capacity of those buildings appropriately, and that's, that's where we have to. But for this, uh, you know, you have the ability to move, move buildings. Uh, if you haven't placed them down yet, you can say, all right, we'll put one here versus put one there. That's why I, I, I recommended that consideration. Good. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Seven hundred forty-five, and it's basically for six trailers or eight trailers. Uh, I know we have eight on there, but we're are two considered part mm -hmm. of our budget number. Uh, that would be the cost for for lease for eight colleges for four years. For the four years, but that would that be six trailers or eight? I know eight. we had eight on there, but we have two already in the budget. Do we want to break that down for me? Right. So what I heard Dr. Heron say is that there are six that would be covered through CARES or ESSER funding and two that are currently included in the operating budget. Right. So the 745 addresses the six trailers. It actually includes all eight. We could, okay. We could pull out, we could, we could do so, the math and pull out the two to tell you what it would be CARES funding or ESSER funding versus operational funding. So that, that money that you have budgeted for the two then we can utilize back in the school budget somewhere else because we'll use CARES money for all eight. So, so as I understand it, what I also heard, though, is that it's a, a year and nine months right. of the cost. So we're yep. probably talking about 300, $250,000 to $300,000 really coming from the federal government? Are you talking about on a yearly basis? Or are you no, talking I'm talking at, the, about at the end. For the, the four-year so, period. 745 for the four-year period. And, and that's eight trailers, but we have two in the budget. Right, so, so they can't be covered by, by the federal money, can they? Only, only one year and nine months, no. so, right, yeah. would be covered by the, the, the federal money, which would be roughly, say, 370, half of the 745. I think you're utilizing a calculus that I'm not familiar with. So let, I just want okay. to make sure that as we're answering questions that, okay. that, that we don't that steer you in the wrong path. So what are you, what are so you trying to determine? first question would be, would be um, is it not the case that since two of the trailers were in the budget, they would not be subject to, to uh, the support of the federal government because they were pre-planned, essentially? I don't know if that makes sense. So you're only talking about the cost for six of the eight that would be the starting point. 
And right. Then, I think what we were attempting to do is to answer the question, what is the total cost of the project? So we, that's why we incorporated all eight in that conversation. Right, and I, okay. and I appreciate that. But we also want to know how much of that will be covered by the federal government versus uh, what schools will need to cover it from local and state funding. And, and in, in that instance, it seems to be uh, a, that uh, if you, t if you uh, assume that we're only talking about um, three quarters of the total $745,000 cost, that's what's eligible. And then it's only eligible for a little less than half of that time period, maybe 40, 40, 40 to 45% of that time period. So um, that means that, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to do the math, but uh, probably something more in the range of two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars would come from the federal government uh, um, over the course of the four years. I don't, I'll, yeah, is that right? That's what, that's what I'm. I'm <laughs> you, you know, Mr. McGlynn, I think for for me and, and the CARES money, there was some provisions that if it was previously budgeted, CARES wouldn't cover it, and then there were a few exceptions to that. The uh -huh. ARP funding that's out there, I think, is more flexible funding, and so I don't know what that would look like. And I think we all are trying to figure out what those rules would be towards that. So you may be correct, and I don't know if anybody has that level of detail yet. That um, And it might be they have it budgeted this year. They don't budget them next year. That covers the second nine months that maybe it wouldn't have covered initially. I mean, I think there's some ways uh -huh. that right. you can okay. approve future budgets to maximize the CARES and ARP funding. And we're all county and school system trying to work through those details. And we don't have those details or the application yet. That should be coming any day. I mean, anything, anything that is viable that we could be paid for by the federal government, obviously we will use the funds in that way. In any case, it's, it, I, I think it's wonderful that we have the assistance coming Absolutely. in. And, and it will help serve this need, yeah. Now, the, the classroom size now, or before the pandemic, not now, <laughs> um, we're about... 23 to 25, I think it was, roughly, we were trying to hit. And now we're going down to 20 to 23 because of the three-foot distancing. Correct. That's our, that's our biggest thing is because I'm wondering, once we get away from the three-foot distancing, is that going to be a rule from then on? We're going to stay at 20 students instead of 25 because that five adds four times down as another classroom and four times down from that's another classroom. And so when we start stacking classrooms, so will we go back to where we were pre-pandemic and go back into 23 to 25 students per teacher? So our normal target ratio of teacher to student, it actually varies depending on the level. Right. So K through two should be 20 to one. So we're going to obviously try to keep it at that. Um, in reality, it went up to 23 to 1 in our classrooms. Um, our target uh, ratio for third grade is 23 to 1. Our target ratio for fourth and fifth is 25 to 1. This brings everyone down 23 to 1 or beneath. So even after pandemic, your early grades still need a smaller class size to be effective and we would go to our normal target ratio. Okay, then, because we've been effective before the pandemic, but now after the pandemic's over, we got to go down further with students to be effective. That's the part I'm kind of, you know, if we were effective before, which we had the best schools in the state, I think in James City County, I think our teachers do wonderful. I think in some instances it's our fourth and fifth grade numbers that were allowed to go higher than they should have in the classroom where we've got very crowded classrooms. But yes, were they reasonably effective and could our teachers do a great job? Yes, there's no question about that. Is it the ideal size to meet the needs of our changing population of students? No, would be the answer. So I think as we move through this and come out the other end, I think it's, it's really worth looking to see the needs of students in every classroom and really to set a class target size like we've always had. We've just never staffed it at that ratio. And will we, as we come out of this, will we still offer <laughs> students if, if they want to learn remotely? Or will we go, you know what, everybody well, like we were before, is coming back. Because I, I, I think our, our classrooms, not only with this, and I've said it before, that our high schools and all are going to change 
you know, before my lifetime's over and there's going to be all kinds of different ways to learn. And this might have just jumped us a little quicker into that. Do you see, and I know it's a crystal ball question and, and I'm, I'm going to hold you to it, but do you see that after we come out of this, will we do some students may only want to remote learn and we're not going to require them to come back into class or are think, we going to require them to come back into class? I think the best place to learn is probably face to face with an excellent teacher in a classroom, but we have been very effective in some classrooms for some students online. It does not meet the needs of every single student. Uh, we are offering a virtual academy at Midland High School next year within our school division. And so far there was about 250 plus students applied. We don't know if they'll stay there. They've got until next week or so to, to opt out. So there still is a, a desire to have it. And I think this year will be like a transition year and then we'll really know how many students want that kind of experience for learning. Uh, one of the, I, I think it's a great opportunity for families who have not been in the public school setting to be offered an excellent education through Williamsburg James City County Schools and be virtual but still have access to play in sports and other activities as well. So I do think that number could stabilize or, or could go up or down in the following year. And I think it would be, it might be an opportunity for state funding and all that if there's a virtual, maybe the students that are deciding, do I want to go here, here, here? They may pick the school system to go to, and you have a whole, you know, there's virtual, and those numbers, because there are students coming to school, they may not be in the classroom, but I would think statewide and funding-wide, it would be up your numbers to have that ability to, you know, some, and, I, and in my family, for example, I've got two that love virtual learning, just, just eating it up. One loves face-to-face -face learning and and the teachers I, I hand it to the teachers have done a great job in both scenarios I've been able to watch both scenarios and they're doing a wonderful job and um, but it's amazing and I'm, and I'm just wondering is that something that might down the road be uh, you know an added bonus to our school systems that we offer two things and and that way we're capturing more students and and more funding from the state well, we, we've done that with elementary this year. The, the state program with Virtual Virginia for K through five, we're not staffing it. We're paying a portion of the ADM for each student, but some of the ADM will stay with the school division. And, and that's a model that we may look at for secondary later, but we're certainly launching our own, own academy this year because of the numbers. So all, all options really are on the table and this will certainly be a transition year, but I know our teachers have learned so much and have been incredible in the virtual setting. And so that skill set, I'm sure they'll continue to use in the classroom. And, and when y'all find that crystal ball that everybody's looking for, I'm if looking we for could it. use it some too, we'd appreciate <laughs> passing it. Back to Absolutely, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for it as well every day, I can assure you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to uh, express my thanks again to Dr. Hearn for coming today and um, being so patient with all these questions and Absolutely. having your staff here and, and Mr. Kelly to, to uh, uh, um, support and provide additional information uh, as we go along. Um, when I came in, I, I really had some questions about the length of time for these um, uh, um, facilities. I don't, I don't like to call them trails. I don't like to call them learning cottages, um, <coughs> but uh, they're necessary. Uh, auxiliary classrooms, obviously, um, and, um, but it does appear to me that uh, um, whatever happens, that these are uh, that the issues we're talking about are not things that are going to go away uh, immediately, and so that it probably makes sense to think in terms of the four-year request that was originally presented. Um, uh, but uh, that's just my my opinion about that. And I, again, I want to thank you for your time and and. Uh, uh, insight. <clears throat> thank you. If I could just uh, take a moment to thank you, Mr. Stevens and all of his staff. Um, we wouldn't be at the place we are in getting these trailers in place for September if approved this evening uh, without all of your staff, Mr. Stevens, and ever just working, everybody working together to make it happen for students. So thank you very much indeed for your help with everything. I just wanted to follow up yes, with just two comments. One, um, 
there, there's always been virtual Virginia that's been, I mean, some of our high school students have yeah. taken advantage of that for a very long time when there's a class that didn't fit into their schedule, et cetera. And then I do just want us to be very careful because what typically used to happen pre-pandemic is that we would say, yes, we have a fifth grade class with 25 kids in it, but by the end of the school year, we had a fifth grade class with 33 you know, kids in it. And when we're already at a time when teachers are not flocking to the profession, I think we need to be very cognizant of, you know, watching those numbers in the future and not just saying, okay, well, the pandemic's over. We've got everybody on an even playing field, so we're going to go back to trying to stuff as many kids as we can in here, which we tend to do to our veteran teachers or our newbies, you know, sometimes because it's like, oh, they won't say anything. They're new or they've done it before. They they know how to handle it. And it's a lot of stress. And I know it's a lot of stress on the school system, too, to try to figure out where these kids go. But, you know, I I – I hope we can get back, you know, I've got a lot of, uh, a lot to say about the pandemic that I won't get into today. But um, anyway, I do appreciate all the time that you took and um, the effort for everybody to be here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we have a choice to, we, we just, can, we can vote them as a block or we can vote them individually or we can pull one if someone wants to pull one or if there's a change that somebody wants to make, might want to. Just, I'll move for all of them together and then if somebody wants to, oh. I, I had originally had some concern about it, but I'm going to defer my concern to them and I will, I'm fine voting on them all at one time. Um, so I, that, with that said, I, I, I do have a, a, a a few more things that I wanted to talk about, but whenever it's appropriate for you. Okay, we can talk about that before we vote on this then. And, yeah. um, Adam, is it okay with a block, or would we be safer to do them individually? Well, you're you're always safer to do them individually, <laughs> sir, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay if you'd, you'd like to do them as a block, as long as you're very clear for the record that you're voting on all of them with well, one, one vote. Nine. Okay. How's the board feel? Fine voting okay. all of them on one nine. All right. You, you want to discuss Yeah, that? I just wanted to, to uh, say thank you again to the, the, the schools for uh, coming and answering the questions because uh, what we got in, the, uh, in our agenda really wasn't uh, enough to give us what we needed to, to be properly consider your, your requests. Um, I got to tell you, first of all, our elementary schools, it's no question they're overcrowded, and I fully support uh, the additional space. Um, one of my concerns, as I've always harped on, has been pre-K. Um, I think that any long-term solution to our crowding problem in the elementary school is going to have to deal with pre-K, uh, and that includes not just the ones that are already in it, but the ones that should be in it that uh, are entitled to it, but don't uh, we don't have the space for them. We need to, to look at that and make the space. So I think part of this study that's going on is, is really important in looking at our, at our facilities going forward. Um, any long-term solution for our overcrowding problem? Uh, I really don't care whether we do it with a, a, a new separate school or, or a new or combined facilities. Uh, but what I do think is that I think we ought to take a look at it from a, a point of view of uh, what we can do for how much money. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that you've got pretty considerable uh, bang for your buck with these trailers. You're not, not a whole lot of money, uh, and yet you get four years' worth of a considerable uh, extra uh, space. So I would urge the board to, to uh, um, school board and the school administration to take a look carefully at that. And when you come back and tell us that you, you want to do either expand elementary schools or build a new elementary school, what I'd really like to see is a very careful analysis of what the cost and benefit of each option would be. And, and uh, you know, somebody, uh, I'm com I can be convinced, but I need to have the, the, the hard data to make me, to convince me, not just because um, we, we decided that's the way we wanted to go. Um, our projections for elementary schools are fairly flat for the next 10 years. I think it's like a third of a percent a year average over the 10-year period. Uh, we were likely to get more uh, students involved because of expanding pre-K. Uh, that's something that needs to be considered in the plan. Um, I, would, uh, I, I would say that I view the trailers as a necessary evil. I came in tonight with a mindset that I didn't like the idea of the four-year SUP um, because 
Uh, I thought it was a, a, an excessive length of time. I think we owe it to the community and we owe it to our uh, children in this community to provide proper full-time permanent facilities for them in a timely manner. Um, and I would like to have trailers be that bridge to get us there. And to get us there in two years versus four years would be much more to my taste than it would, uh, you know, as proposed. That being said, I, I'm, I'm willing to support your four years request. Mm -hmm. But what I would like to get from the school uh, administration and the school board is a commitment, if you will, that in looking at the uh, pre-K program and looking at your analysis of, of your needs for space over the long term, um, that you come back and give that to us as soon as you can so that we can get the ball rolling on a permanent solution well before these SUPs expire. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, put you behind, behind the eight ball on that, uh, but that's, uh, I just, I just didn't want it to be too open-ended. Um, so I hope that that makes clear where I, where I am on this and, and what I, what, what you, what I expect. Um, and with that, I'll be ready to vote on. All right. Well then I'll be, everybody have enough discussion. All right. I'll be looking for a motion on the SUP 21. Move the motion. Zero, zero, oh, yeah. I was going to read them all. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Zero zero five SUP twenty one zero zero six SUP twenty one zero zero seven SUP twenty one zero zero eight SUP twenty one zero zero ten SUP twenty one zero zero eleven. Well, that covers. Okay. Thank and you. I move the motion. Okay. Motion on floor. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. Hippel. Aye. Motion carries. All right, board considerations, fiscal year 2022 budget appropriations. Ms. Day, welcome. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. Attaches a resolution to appropriate the fiscal year 2022 budget. The resolution reflects changes made to the county administrator's proposed budget. These changes resulted in no change to the total overall budget as proposed. Staff recommends adoption of the resolution, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? I had a question about, did, was there a change with, um, I couldn't ask you before, but the cigarette tax, because that, that came in a little lower, but are you just... The estimate in the proposed budget was about $900,000. Yeah. We do believe that figure was conservative. Okay. Um, all of those dollars are earmarked to the capital expenditure right. program, so we would uh, monitor that throughout the year okay. uh, as the revenue is received. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bradshaw was at eight fifty dollars with twenty. dollars Yes, his estimate was $850,000 uh, with an effective date of September first, 2021. Okay. Thank you. That'd be I mean, I'll just I'll just thank the uh, uh, staff, uh, Ms. Day and the county administrator, and all the rest who were involved in developing the budget and doing such a careful and and uh, thoughtful job again uh, in um, producing a document that allows us to uh, the one on the one hand uh, demonstrate uh, true um, fiscal conservatism and, and stewardship of, of taxpayer dollars, and the other hand uh, uh, attempts to meet the real needs of our community and. Uh, to address uh, the desires of people who want to live in a quality community. And so, uh, great job all around, and uh, um, I'd be happy to move the adoption. Okay, the I've got one thing I want to. Sure. The, um, you know, I think y'all did a great job on the, not only last year, but this year's budget as well, and getting everything together and, and staying within our needs and, and wants in the community. So, you know, I support the budget. I don't support the, the tax for the, the cigarette tax in there, so I won't be able to support the entire budget because they're they're one unit. But um, I support the rest of the budget. Y'all have done an excellent job on their great work and, and getting that together and, and figuring out all our needs. So I just want to make that statement before we got in there that, you know, this is the first budget I've not approved. So it kind of feels a little funny. So, <laughs> But that's the one thing I need to pull out. All right. John, did you have a motion on that? I did. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. A roll call, for it, please, sir. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Motion carries. All right. I ask for a motion to go into closed session. Considerations and acquisition 
of the interest of real estate property along Ironbound Road pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A3. .2, 2 of the Code of Virginia. So moved. So moved. Would you roll call, sir, please? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right.
Let's come back in uh, open session. Mr. Chairman, I move to certify that we only spoke about those items we indicated we would speak about. Thank you. Roll call, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right, next I need a motion for adjournment until 1 p.m. on May 25th, 2021 for a business meeting. So move. So move. Roll call, please, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All you. Okay. Get the hammer. Call this meeting of the James City Service Authority Board of Directors regular meeting into session. Good evening, Mr. Powell. How are you? Good evening. How are you? Good. Would you please call the roll? Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. McLennan? Here. Mr. Hipple? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. The general manager has requested that a closed session for a property discussion be added to the agenda. May I have a motion to amend the agenda and add this item? Motion. Thank you. Mr. Powell, if you'll call the roll. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. We have no presentations this evening. Do we have any public comment? No, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we have a consent to calendar. Tonight's consent calendar consists of minutes adoption. May I have a motion to approve? So move. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Thank you. We have no public hearings. We have two board considerations this evening. Initial contract award, Kingswood Water Main Replacement, $280,555. And authorization for general manager to execute final project contract. Mr. Powell, are you going to give a presentation? Uh, yes, ma'am. The resolution before you tonight would uh, award a contract for the Kingswood Water Main Replacement Project. This project consists of replacing and upsizing approximately 15,100 feet of water main in the 1960s, 1970s era neighborhood water distribution system. Uh, the existing water mains are undersized by current standards, and the area has exhibited an increased number of main breaks within the last several years. Uh, the procurement method that was used for this project is design-build, uh, and um, uh, we've gone through a two-step competitive negotiation process to hire a team of an uh, engineering firm and a contractor to uh, award the project in one, in one contract. Uh, we originally received seven proposals, uh, narrowed it down to three to interview, and ultimately uh, a committee has recommended the award of the contract to Toana contractors, with Rummel, Klepper, and Call providing the design services. Uh, the initial contract is uh, uh, $280,555, and that consists of the design builder fee to go to the 70% design stage. Uh, at that point, uh, once we're at the 70% de design stage, we would then go to uh, a bid for the, uh, or negotiate for the construction project. This resolution authorizes the contract award of $280,000 thousand five hundred fifty five dollars then authorizes the general manager to award uh, the construction or to approve the uh, construction contract as long as it does not exceed the budgeted amount of four million seven hundred sixty five thousand uh, recommend approval of the resolution uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have questions could you just explain the differences between the two pipes that uh, you're looking at uh, are there oh the two pipes yeah, yeah. So, uh, PVC and ductile iron. Right. So um, ductile iron uh, are larger pipes, and sometimes if they go in the ground deeper, that uh, our standards actually require that type of ductile iron pipe in certain in certain circumstances. Um, and uh, it's um, it's it's sturdier uh, in in the long run. Um, a little harder, a little harder to install it's because it's not as flexible. But, and is it harder to to maintain? I would say ultimately it's easier to maintain. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's, there's, that's a debatable point. Um, <laughs> um, that's not something you would necessarily get universal agreement on. But in, in my view, it's a little, it's, in my view, it's a little sturdier and uh, it's less likely for, for breaks. So in my mind, it's easier to maintain. Your motion. Motion for approval. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Changes to the regulations governing utility service and resolution of appropriation for fiscal year 2022 budget. Mr. Powell? There are two resolutions before you, uh, and this is the method we've traditionally used. The first resolution makes changes to the regulations regarding the proposed fee changes, um, including the um, including the fee for the um, uh, um, Grinder pumps, uh, and then the second uh, second resolution is just simply the appropriation of the budget. Uh, no changes have been made to the budget since your since your work session. Uh, I recommend approval of both resolutions. 
Discussion? Questions? Do Motion. Need, do we need to do them as one? Um, I think or? we've typically done them as two separate I'll, resolutions. I'll move the motion on the regulations. Mr. Powell? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Budget. Thank you. Mr. Powell? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. All right. I'm going to ask for a closed session for the discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property in James City County as a public water source, including an unsolicited confidential proposal where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A3 and the discussion or consideration of the investment of public funds to provide adequate wa public water supply, including an unsolicited confidential proposal and a water supply agreement with Newport News, where competition and bargaining are involved, where, if made public initially, the financial interest of the JCSA would be adversely affected pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A6. Wow. Sir, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Powell. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. So we are in closed session.
motion to certify the closed session. Um, Madam Chair, I move to certify that we only spoke about those items we indicated we would speak about going into closed session. Thank you. Mr. Powell? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Glennon? Aye. Mr. Ippel? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, board requests and directives? Oh. Seeing none. General manager's update. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I did have a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, Number one, with your concurrence, um, I intend to initiate a public information campaign um, requesting that JCSA water customers voluntarily refrain from irrigation until the water main on Route 5 is repaired. As summer demands increase, we may experience lower water pressure in the western part of our service area, and while it is not noticeable to the customer now, we are concerned about the adequacy of pressure and flow for fire protection during peak times and irrigation season. Although reduced pressure is primarily a concern in the western part of the service area, we believe that system-wide restrictions for irrigation are warranted because the absence of the water main on Route 5 west has increased the burden on the rest of the distribution system and has reduced the overall reliability of the distribution system. Therefore, it is best to take actions to reduce stress on the entire system. Um, I would also note that if we, um, if we do implement some sort of voluntary restriction, it would be my intent to waive the submeter fee um, that's on the monthly bill for all of our submeter customers during the time that these restrictions are in place. Um, so restrictions you saying not to irrigate at all, or just or, or? Well, they'll be they'll be voluntary. Our message is going to be to ask people not to irrigate at all. At all, okay. Uh, you know. Um, uh, these are, this is not a recommendation I really take lightly or want to make, but I just think that in the interest of public safety, it's the prudent thing to do. What's, What's the status what? of the project at this point? Uh, we had originally hoped that the project would be done by June 30th. Um, I think that is probably, uh, that's the best case scenario. Uh, the project does require uh, local, state, and federal permits because it does disturb wetlands. Uh, so uh, the permitting process is taking us a little longer than we had hoped. Um, it is progressing, uh, but uh, uh, but I think June 30th is probably optimistic at this point. So will you waive the fees on everyone? We would w we would waive the fee on everybody that's got a submeter, even if there was still water. Yes. Wouldn't have a, unless they reported. You wouldn't have a way of knowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's it's a dollar fifty a month. Yeah. And the the time it would take to go in and adjust Find out. for on an individual basis is just not it's not it's not worth the time. So I think out of fairness, uh, granted, some people if it's voluntary, I'm sure some people will still irrigate. But um, I think the the most effective way to do it is just to have that have have that in place for everybody. Do you need a, a board action on that? Or uh, I do not need formal action, okay. but I did I did want to get. Yes. the sense of the board before I move forward with Sounds that. Sounds like so it's a matter of safety, yeah. Yeah. certainly. Okay. okay, 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 okay. All right, and then the second item I wanted to bring up is um, the uh, issue of disconnections. Um, JCSA wants to achieve a balance between the need to provide relief to customers financially impacted by the pandemic and the need to resume disconnections to prevent delinquent balances from reaching unmanageable levels. Um, you may have noticed from the from the dashboard that that it is starting to creep up again, uh, and uh, we do have we've we've spent at this point a little under 47 percent of the CARES Act funds that have been allocated to us. So we still have over 50 percent of those funds that are that are available. And um, my 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 goal is uh, if we uh, if we implement the or, or reinitiate disconnections that it will help. Um, motivate people to fill out the paperwork they need to be able to take advantage of that assistance before that assistance is no longer um, available. Uh, I, th I think JCSA has a strong history of working with customers to prevent disconnections. Uh, we have very liberal payment plans. Uh, we are willing to work with customers to develop payment plans from six to 24 months. Uh, disconnection would certainly be the last case uh, or, uh, or last resort um, for, for any of our customers. Um, but um, but, but in, in my view, I, I think the time has come to, to consider that. If the board is uh, am amenable, I would ask you to schedule a public hearing because that's what it's going to take to reinitiate disconnections. Uh, I would uh, ask that you schedule a public hearing for your next, uh, your next meeting on June 8th. 
Is there a way to, um, and I'm sure you've probably already done it, send out a flyer or a tag on the door or something and say that, hey, you are, you're in jeopardy of being disconnected, but if you fill this out, right. you may be able to have it paid for, and maybe we can. Yes. We, we've done that once, okay. um, and, our, and absolutely, we would do that again before we disconnect anybody. We're going to do the door, the door tags for anybody that's delinquent and, and give them an opportunity, uh, another opportunity to request assistance before we turn anybody. How did that anybody. work as far as the first time? Did you get a lot of response? or? Uh, to be honest with you, we, I, we did not get the response that I thought we would. Because, wow. uh, mm -hmm. you know, as I said, we've still got a little over 50% of that money, uh, that CARES Act money left. And it's in, it's in the organization's best interest. More importantly, it's in the customer's best interest that, that those funds be utilized before they expire. Is there anything we can do with Rebecca and, and trying to, you know, get together and say, hey, the, these are, we're, 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 we've got a group of customers that we want to help out, and maybe she might have some in her group that, hey, I'll, I'll contact them, I'll let them know, hey, I'll help you fill this out. Right, right. Yeah, you know, we can... We, that's that's a good idea, Mr. Apple. We can certainly pursue that. Um, See if we can get that help. Uh, you know, I think that we did a pretty good job of notifying all well, the customers sure. who were affected. But um, but maybe you know that may be another step that we can take. I, I think so. that if you do go back to having the disconnection as an option, uh, it might put a little more emphasis on folks to apply for that. Because I was uh, like uh, Doug said, I was a little surprised at how little of it was used the first time around on a voluntary basis. So I, if it applies a little extra pressure to try to get that, that money expended so people can be detected, um, I think that's what I'd, the I'd, I'd uh, support bringing the uh, yeah. thing back next to us at next meeting. It's the relationship between the amount of the delinquent uh, payments right now and the money left in the care. Uh, you know, I didn't print out the... Um, Hold, hold, I may I may have that. Hold on a second. If not, I'll certainly get it for you. Um, our current arrearages at five hundred and nine thousand dollars, and the amount remaining of CARES Act funds is one hundred and sixty-eight. So, about a third, roughly. So, so one hundred sixty-eight thousand. So 168,000 left in CARES Act funds, okay. total so arrearages. So basically, if we exhausted all the CARES Act, there's still going to be some folks that are yes. going to have to have arrangements or whatever. Yes. And is that going to be, would that, is this number, from what you know, um, high uh, compared to our normal arrearage? Uh, this number is, this number is high compared to our normal arrearage is, this number is not high compared to other jurisdictions, you know, even accounting for size. I we, saw that. We do not have a... I mean, I mean, compared to other localities, we don't have a delinquency problem, but it is a problem that is it has set, certainly been been growing for us. Yeah, I'm, what are the other jurisdictions that that are higher than ours as far as delinquencies? What do they attribute that to? Do you know? Uh, I think it's um, a lot of it is demographics. You know, um, I didn't really highlight it, and maybe I should have. There's a chart in your in your budget book. Uh, you know, every year we 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 come and show you the the um, the rates and how they're they're so low compared to other jurisdictions. Right. Uh, we put another me uh, uh, metric in the budget this year, which was called um, uh, what's uh, the bur it's, it's the burden, you know, and it's uh -huh. it's a it's a formula. Uh, it, it, it's a formula where they take the community's average income and compare it to what your what your rates are. Yeah, and it really be ours was like three point nine percent, and the next closest was nine percent. Um, the 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 because our fees are low, our, the burden the 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 burden on the customer is really low compared to other mm. localities, and I think that contributes to a large degree to why we don't have as much issues with, uh, with, uh, with delinquencies. It was just another way, it was another way of showing, uh, you know, that uh, yeah. uh, it's, we're, we're, we're affordable, you know. It, it'd be neat to see with those delinquencies, is it small families, you know, if, if, 
if that's easy to do, it might not yeah. be. Yeah. Just to see where that pattern is. Right. In in our. I, I thought know, the dashboard sort of showed that we actually had a, a, a spike in delinquencies, both not not only in individual but in some of the corporate. Oh yeah, yeah that's corporate. true. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. It's probably small businesses again. Yeah, that's true. Small families. It'd be interesting to know where that is, and, yeah. you know, because we had that money out there for, you know, small businesses. Yeah. As, you know, and there was still some of that left. Right. Well, and there's a big new tranche of money for restaurants. Yeah. Right? And so maybe some of that money could be, in turn, used and utilized to pay their bills on water. In the so, in the businesses, the it's a few it's a fewer number, uh, with a larger amount. The yeah. the residential tends to be you know a little more more spread out. One thing I should probably mention. It's really sort of getting into the details, but. Uh, the number that I cited a few minutes ago, total arrearages of $509,000, that's total. That is total arrearages. The number that we use on the dashboard is like 90 days. Uh, so right. the, the numbers you see on the dashboard are slightly, are going to be less than the total. Um, uh, so, but, so the 500000 is includes people who just haven't paid the last bill yet? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, with the fi actually the five no, let me let me let me qualify that the five hundred thousand number did, does not include zero to thirty days. Uh -huh, right. So you got to be more than thirty. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I think that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, if there could be a motion to adjourn until five p.m. Mm -hmm. on June eighth, twenty twenty one, for the regular meeting. Motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.